Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Versus Stars podcast. Now, my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Elizabeth Dennehy boards the Muller ship. You know her as Lieutenant Commander Shelby in Star Trek The Next Generation. Now she returns in Season 3 of Picard. Come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Miss Dennehy. Thank you so much for coming to the Versus Stars podcast. Oh, please call me Elizabeth. Elizabeth, most certainly. And thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to speak with you. What inspired your love of acting and who were your earliest influences? So I can't remember a time when I didn't want to be an actor. Um, my father and his brother were actors always. They, Even before they were working professionally, they memorized whole scenes from movies. I was steeped in film and theater from as early as I can remember. My father created a community theater in the town where I grew up, uh, Amityville in, on Long Island. Yo, Amityville, Amityville Community Theater. And when we were little kids, we were the snow children in Carousel. We were the no neck monsters in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. So I, I, I guess that was just normal. And so, to be an actor seemed like the greatest thing in the world because um, my friends who had fathers who worked in office jobs, they always seemed, you know, never home. They were always away. And I can remember my friend's father saying to me uh, with envy, you know, how did your dad have the courage to pursue his dream? And when you when you see your dad doing something that's so much fun, and you see other friends' dads kind of, you know, wistfully wishing that they had pursued what they wanted to be when they were a kid, um, you you it's easy to gravitate towards. Like that's way more fun to do. So I just never I can't remember a time where I wasn't singing and dancing and make me watch making people watch. Uh, my sisters and I were just texting about this. We were obsessed with musicals and we would make anybody in our house sit and listen to us while we would play the entire uh, soundtrack, original cast recording of Man of La Mancha on the kazoos. We were, <laughs> we were always performing, always acting out albums. That was our big thing was taking Jesus Christ Superstar and acting out all the parts or The Wizard of Oz and acting out all the parts. That was the way we we grew up was acting stuff out. And I remember in the fourth grade being cast as Helena in A Midsummer Night's Dream at school and just dancing all the way home. And my father doing community theater and he did The Tempest and we were fairies. It was just nor so normal in, in, in my growing up. So I guess it was predestined that I would pursue that. So as you said, your father is Brian Dennehy. So right. what advice did he give you when you wanted to enter the profession of acting? And was he excited or more trepidatious about you entering the profession? The first thing he said to me was get rid of my Long Island accent. <laughs> <laughs> when I go home, it comes out. And when I'm with other people who are from my land, it comes out really <laughs> big time. So he said, you got to get rid of your accent. So I can, I can, uh, you know, suppress that urge. Uh, the Long Islanders, and he was horrified. He did not want this. He, I think my dad was one of those typical guys in the 60s who wanted to have sons, and he had three girls instead. And he, I, I think as glamorous as it looks to us, his life, it was hard. You know, when, when I was 16 was when he made his first movie, which was semi-tough. And up until then, it was really kind of hard scrabble. It was very, mm. we were very financially unstable. We, at, at at one point, we had to rent out our house and move in with my grandparents. He was working odd jobs. Uh, let's just put it this way. My parents had to get married. And I was born in 1960. My mother was 19. My father was a Marine. I was born in Camp Lejeune. And by the time he was 25, he had three kids. Oh, wow. 
So, um, yeah, so he was doing like odd jobs and theater on the side. And for a while there, when we were living with my grandparents, they were like, we will help you, we'll support you, but you have to quit out this acting bullshit. You got to stop doing this. And he was doing it on the slide like a junkie. He was going down to uh, regional theaters in um, Bucks County Playhouse and and touring, uh, but not letting them know. I mean, it was really, he had a compulsion to do this. So I guess I caught that from him. So he was horrified. He did not want his children to be actors. He wanted us to be professional people who had um, respectable careers and had more stable income and were financially, you know, uh, comfortable and not living hand to mouth and not living that gypsy kind of life that it was like. He was very, very lucky that everything worked out as well as it did. How it started for him in uh, in New York, you could have this thing on Long Island where you would go into the city and do showcases. And he would do like lunchtime theater. He would do all these showcases. This is before the internet. I don't even know how people learned about this kind of thing. So he was doing showcases and he was auditioning for things and he got cast by Mike Nichols as an understudy in the play streamers at Lincoln Center. And then Mike Nichols recommended him for Semi-Tough, the movie he did with Chris Christopherson and Burt Reynolds. And that was it, that was the start of it. So word of mouth spread and he was very, very, very lucky. So, so when you saw how difficult of a path your father took, what made you think, I want that too. <laughs> it's like such a challenge. Even, even as a young person, it looked like fun. This was a typical weekend in my house. We would get in the car. He was doing Man of La Mancha at the Lampertville in Music Festival Summer Theater in Lampertville, New Jersey, in a tent, a big tent. Can you believe it? We would get in the car in Long Island. We would drive into the city and pick up two of the most gorgeous men I ever saw in my life, these flamenco dancers who were Sancho Panzo's horses. And I would go every single weekend and watch them do Men of La Mancha, hang out backstage with these gorgeous, wonderful actors. Even though um, you know, he didn't make a lot of money, it was, it was very glamorous to me and it looked like a lot of fun. And then he was doing dinner theater on Long Island uh, the Sayville in uh, the Watermill in Dinner Theater, and he did funny thing happened on the way to the Forum, and um, he was a great Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof, and he directed lots of shows at Amityville Community Theater or ACT, and it was glamorous and it was fun and it was exciting and thrilling and nothing about it was boring. Everybody always says to actors when they're starting out, it's really, really hard. It's really, really hard. Well, I wasn't afraid of hard work, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize until I had committed to it that what they meant was the time in between jobs, the rejection, the constant mm -hmm. audition, being told no, and then collecting unemployment. Yes, that is very hard. And which is why when my son was in high school and pursuing theater. I tried every which way to dissuade him from doing it <laughs> and wanting him to have a professional career with great stability. I think that's very normal as a parent to want your child to not suffer. It's it's heartbreaking to be to get close on things. I I auditioned seven times for the movie JFK for Oliver Stone and then didn't get cast. Mm. It's crushing. It can really drain the life out of you. So no parent wants that for their kid. I think it's totally normal. So when my children were in elementary school, I have two beautiful sons. Uh, we shielded them. They, they did not know what we did for a living. We didn't take them to premieres and all that. They knew about my father because, you know, since then computers were invented and they knew, they knew that my, uh, my dad was an actor. We went to the Ratatouille premiere in LA and, but the, theater teacher at school was always like, when are you going to give me your, your boys? And I was like, get back, get away, yeah. away from them. They're going to be lawyers. They're going to be doctors. They're going to be professional people. And now one is a filmmaker and one is an actor. So we, <laughs> we so, you know, there you go. Um, you just, you know, it's just, you, you have to have a lot of temerity. So no, you just have to have a lot of tenacity and thank God it's paying off for my son was in the Weird Al Yankovic biopic. He was one of the guys in the band and he's right now doing 
a TV series. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say what it is, but it's set in Chicago and it's based in a restaurant. Hmm. Very interesting. Very cool. Yeah. And he's, um, so he's doing really, really well. I'm super proud of him. And my other son is a filmmaker and he made a film that's uh, being shown in all sorts of festivals, a short film. So we're, we're busting with pride and that's my TED talk on how kids come out hardwired. Like you, know, <laughs> you can try all you might, all, all you can, and you just can't stop it. So, you know, three generations now, I guess um, it's nature over nurture. Mm. Well, I read something else that was very interesting about you that you're a Shakespeare geek. Is that correct? I love Shakespeare. I've always loved Shakespeare. And I, um, just recently stopped teaching. I was teaching for six years um, Shakespeare at an arts high school, the arts high school that my boys attended, actually. And yeah, I I just took to it, man, like a duck takes to water. Like the minute, I guess the, the my first exposure would have been my dad doing The Tempest. He directed it and played Stefano and we were the fairies and I just couldn't get enough of it. Why do you think Shakespeare survived so well? I mean, even, I mean, it's been, God, was it now 400 years? And it's still being read. It still, to me, applies to the world we live in. What makes it survive so well? I think that he is describing what it is to be human. I think what separates him from everybody else is you have moments of great doubt. Somebody who thinks they know what they're doing and then they'll be all alone on stage and go, what am I doing? Hold on a second. Hmm. And that will happen to kings, princes. So no matter how high you are up in status, you're still plagued with self-doubt, wavering degrees of self-doubt and confidence, elation and depression. And who can't relate to that? Hmm. So he showed people who were royalty as real human beings. I think the fact that he had so few stage directions means that you can read a play and say, oh, like I'm gonna do Twelfth Night. I directed Twelfth Night at the high school. And Twelfth Night basically is boy meets girl, boy confuses the girl for the boy, and then everybody ends up happily ever after. Well. At an arts high school, you can, you, I'm sure it's not a shock to believe this, with a lot of gender fluidity, I didn't want such a heter heteronormative ending where th there's two, um, uh, you know, um, guy and girl couples getting married. So I had Andrew Aguecheek and Antonio the Pirate go off together. Aww. And the place went crazy and cheered. You, you can do so much. You can take the things out of context. You can put any kind of statement. You can make it fit. It's so ambidextrous and pliable and malleable. And I, th I, I, I so I think that that's why it's Shakespeare still is being done to this day more than a lot of other works. He invented the English language. He invented humanity. I don't think it's too high. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that. So which plays have you performed in personally? Oh my gosh. Um, my, one of my very first professional jobs was in Henry five in New York Shakespeare festival starring Kevin Klein and Mary Elizabeth Mastro Antonio. Oh, wow. Yeah. Kevin Klein was Henry five and Mary Elizabeth was the princess and I was an understudy. And there was an actress named Christine Nielsen who played the French queen and hostess quickly. And I was her understudy. Um, yeah. So that was one of my very first jobs out of school. Um, I did uh, hostess quickly. Again, that, that part is just in my DNA um, at Antius, which is a theater company that Armin Shimmerman and Kitty Swink and a lot of, oh. yeah. In Hollywood. Um what other I did did you did you hear about the show must go online during the pandemic where this incredible guy um Rob Miles decided to do every week a different Shakespeare show in the order in which they were believed to have been written oh, and wow. I did three of those I did Winter's Tale and one of the Henry Sixes and um played the king in Henry Four part two so that was a lot of fun um yeah so I'm I'm I, I can't get enough of Shakespeare. I love, 
Um, yeah, that's say cool that you talked about Armin Sherman because uh, he's a friend that she's been on a few times to talk about his books. And he was again, for people who don't know, he's a, a Shakespeare uh, scholar. Yes. So that, that must have been a hell of a thing to perform with him on uh, Shakespeare. Yeah, he's he's great. He's really is great. And there's a there's a Shakespeare company in town called the Independent Shakespeare Company. They do free Shakespeare in Griffith Park. I'm on their board and uh, they're wonderful. You know, they they um, they work really, really hard to make their work accessible and mm. have the population of L.A. see themselves up on the stage. Like I've, I've you know, kids in my class who are not white say I did had no idea that that Shakespeare could, you know, sound like my family and look like look like my family. And it's so important for everybody mm. to feel that Shakespeare can be for them. Well, that's why I think it was so cool. Um, and like I said, the Macbeth with Denzel Washington playing Macbeth, which I think was the first ever time I, I saw the character played by a non-white individual. But to mm -hmm. me, I thought to myself, it proves the point. You know, these characters are universal. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now another a, a great thing is that with, with Shakespeare is that it the, the language when he said it is very musical. So when you teach it, is because. One thing that's been debated with me and my principal is whether or not, because of the students, if I should shift over to the modern version of the Shakespearean text, how much do you think is lost by switching over? Who wrote the modern version? Um, I'm, not I'm not sure. Basically, but the way the book is set up, there's um, one side of the page is the Shakespearean version, and the other side of the page is the modern version. Uh, the, uh, if it's the modern version, it's not Shakespeare. Yeah. Right? I... Um... It's like, to me, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think when they start teaching cursive, I think that's kind of sad. I think it's sad if kids can't drive stick shift. Because <laughs> let's face it, if you can drive a stick shift, you can drive anything. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm obsolete. But I, I was working recently with a student. I do a lot of private coaching. And there was a, we were working on a speech from Richard III, and I, I, I can't quote the exact speech, but we were trying to figure out why he put the words in the order that they're in. Wouldn't it make more sense if this bit was over here? And then we were working it through, and then all of a sudden we went, but maybe this guy is in, a, in emotional distress stress he has just learned that his brother is dead so he's not thinking clearly mm. and his thoughts are jagged so maybe Shakespeare actually did that on purpose so what is wrong with asking people to go why is it this way why do you think it is this way and so for us to instead of smoothing out all the bumps and making everything flat why not take the journey, go up and down the hills, push ourselves, challenge ourselves? You might just see something through that portal that you never could have even imagined. I mean, is it really so hard to say thee and thou instead of you and yours? There's a reason for it, it's poetry. And, and the same people, you know, any, any kid who from the, you know, in school, I would say the last eight years can spit out guns and ships from Hamilton. And they, and I bet those kids who know every single word in Hamilton, there's words in that, in that score that they don't understand, but they've learned them. If you can do that, then why can't you figure out what, what is meant by vouchsafe? Mm. You know what? I'm going to, it's exercising your brain, push yourself, challenge yourself. At, instead of making the scope of your perspective smaller to fit your small world, why don't you broaden your horizon? And I mean, if we continue to do this, how are you gonna pick up any of the great classical works mm. and figure it out? I just went through, I read Ulysses last summer. Yeah something I'd always wanted to do. And I just, I was in Ireland. My husband's Irish. So we spent a lot of time in Ireland and I decided I'm here. I'm going to be here for six weeks. I'm, I'm going to do it. And was I lost? Oh yes. Was it confusing? Oh my God. But I listened to it on um, the RTE recording of Ulysses that actors did in the eighties. Yeah. I tried to do an episode a day, but pushing myself, it's really good for our brains to do that. Mm. Well, at least I'm going to take you to uh, my work and you can argue with my principal and make it happen. But I will say they did uh, 
fight their way through Dynasty Inferno, which once again was not the easiest text to read. And I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if they can pull off uh, Macbeth because, like I said, it's what is my favorite play of all of Shakespeare. It, it's, you know, it's the most fascinating. I, I, I just love that one so much. So that of all the ones to teach, that's my favorite to teach. Macbeth. Right. So I, I look forward to going. Oh, like I said, I, I, it would be fantastic to have you. I'm going to have them write some questions for you. And like I said, it should be very entertaining. Great. So uh, so we're going to move uh, on a little bit to um, another memorable role of yours, which you played Lieutenant Commander Shelby in Star Trek The Next Generation, which, once again, very famous uh, part in, uh, in the franchise. So how did you get involved with the show? And were you already a fan of the franchise? Okay, so one question is very easy to answer. I... Um had an audition. I was 28. I uh, had just moved to LA, hadn't been here that long, went on, on, a, on an audition. And I'm going to say something that people are going to be mad at me for, but I was so haughty and so full of myself. And uh, sci-fi was like, are you kidding me? Some <laughs> space show. So no, I did not watch the original show, did not know Next Gen from anything. And um, when I go to conventions, people are like, well, Sometimes people say, if you don't, or if you're not into sci-fi and fantasy, what did you watch? I was, um, I and still am and always will be, I guess, an Anglophile. I was the kid, the geek who watched Upstairs, Downstairs, The Six Wives of Henry VIII, Brideshead Revisited, all the Merchant Ivory movies. That was my jam. That was my lane. Sci-fi, um, you know, it just didn't appeal to me at all. I don't know why. I guess it was just too much science. <laughs> <laughs> science and math were not my thing. So I've always loved period. The, you know, the merchant ivory stuff was just so what I was so into. Um, so no, I had no idea. When I got on the set, I literally said to Jonathan, oh, you're Riker. I thought Riker might have been the baldy guy. <laughs> <laughs> completely oblivious but i will say this i am really glad and i think it was a good thing that i didn't know or didn't care i didn't have any idea of the importance of this because i think that helped me be shelby just like what what do you mean why can't i why can't i do this why can't i just take an away team and go down to the island the planet you know it uh the brashness of shelby not waiting for permission um I think it was easier to do those things to not care what Riker thought being an actor who didn't have a clue what, what the show was. You know, it's kind of interesting. I, you know, once again, I had, I've interviewed a lot of people from Star Trek um, in my time doing the podcast, like Sherman, uh, JG Hertz or some, something like that. Those, those individuals, and they always say the same thing, which is they all had the Shakespearean background and that having a Shakespearean, Shakespearean background helped them with Star Trek because of the language and the tech, uh, jargon did that help you it, uh, absolutely I don't know if you saw ready room but Will Wheaton and I actually talked about this um in Shakespeare you have to say the words like you talk this way all the time and that's exactly what you have to do with techno babble if I'm saying separate the saucer section assign a skeleton crew to create a diversion right and when I first got that line I was like it took me hours and hours and hours to learn that line. But what I did was I said, okay, separate the saucer section. The saucer section on the ship must be that di that dome, that dish. So separate it from the ship. That makes sense. Assign a skeleton crew to create a diversion. It makes sense. And you have to do the same exact thing with Shakespeare. If you're doing my mistress with a monster is in love near to her close and consecrated bower while she was in her dull and sleeping hour you have to make it make sense so that it sounds like i talk this way all the time mm. now somebody listening to shakespeare might say what was that word bower what is a bower but you don't you don't need to understand every single word in order to understand what i'm saying mm. so it's kind of interesting too is when you're talking about being uh, you said you're very like prideful as, as an individual. That's why you didn't like um, or um, sci-fi. I think that's the word you used was prideful or was very sorry. I can't remember which one you used to describe yourself to discuss why you didn't like sci-fi at the time. Uh, oh, haughty. I was haughty. So yes, haughty. haughty. So haughty. in many ways, people describe Shelby in very much the same way. So did you use a little bit of yourself in Shelby? Uh, actually... 
I would say now at 30 years later that I was really stupid. <laughs> I was, I was stupid. I mean, I had, I was haughty in that oh, some stupid sci-fi show. This is not beneath me. I would never say that, but just, it wasn't what I aspired to. Mm. Um, and I remember walking in the room for the audition and there was an actress called Joanna Pakula in there who had just finished doing Gorky Park was a big hit. My father was in it and she was in the room. She was this lead in that. And I thought, oh my God, she's here. That's what I mean about being stupid. This mm. is a big deal. This is a big deal. And so when I got it, I thought, wow, this is amazing. And now 30 years later, having been asked to go back and do Picard, I now feel like I would have been so lucky to have been a series regular mm. and to been and so blessed to have been such a small part of that universe and the, the fans and the love from the fans and the cameos and the fan mail and the conventions and and just being with Will and and John on the uh, ready room, it was just like just just a love session it was just mm. you know and if you have that how lucky you are so i was young and stupid i was fresh and um i, I like i said i think when i did henry five with kevin klein i thought my life is going to be like this this is just where my life is going to be never wanted to move to la i moved out to la with a play um i created with a bunch of friends in new york called tony and tina's wedding and it went out to la and so started doing auditions and just kind of, you know, drifted along like that from job to job. So in your opinion, when you think about uh, Shelby, do you consider her more ambitious, well-intentioned or irresponsible? Well, I'm never going to say irresponsible because let me ask you a question. Was I right? You're right, but I will say when she went down on the planet with just without telling anybody, uh, just with data, that's a little irresponsible, right? <laughs> yeah, but I'm the, the lives were at stake. That's true. Good point. I, Fair enough. Okay, so I wasn't I wasn't waiting for anybody to give me permission, but here's something that a lot of people I think don't realize: when we did best best of both worlds, it was the last episode of fifth season. Season, I believe, and the first episode of the sixth season. We did not know, we did not see the second script while we were shooting the first one. We had no idea how this was going to resolve. I didn't know if I was a Borg in disguise, which I think they call changelings now. Mm. I didn't know if I was going to be a bad guy or a good guy. I didn't know if Riker and I were going to be fall in love with each other or we were going to kill each other. We had no idea. So we were playing, if, if you watch it now, we were planting the seeds for any possible option, any possible mm. eventuality, because we had no idea where this was going and how it was going to resolve itself. So when those moments where I got under his skin or raised his, his you know, his fury, um, it needed to be justified his reaction. So if he was he was annoyed that I went down there, that's good that you you identified with him in that moment. But then there are also times when I hopefully you identified with Shelby, who was trying to save lives and save, you know, the world. And this guy was making her follow protocols. And remember, in that episode, he says, she reminds me of me. What happened to that part of me? Mm. So he knew deep down in the darkest part of his soul that she was right to be strong headed and strong willed. Shelby, it to me is the girl in the classroom with the hand going up, oh, 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 pick on me, pick on me, pick on me. She knows the answer. She doesn't care about letting other guys have ideas. She's right and she's enthusiastic and zealous. Should mm. she just like sit on her gifts and just go, oh, let, let's let other people um, have a, have a spotlight for a second. No, she didn't care if people liked her or not. She had great ideas and she was, um, strong willed and, um, zealous. Now, one thing they kind of played on a little bit in that, in that first episode with the idea of Riker leaving, leaving to become a captain is the potential for Shelby to have been the first officer of Picard later on. Do you think that would have been a good fit? 
Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think Michael Pillar knew what he was doing with the second episode when he wrote the first one. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, there was, there's lots of different things that could have happened. Um, but yeah. So I'm just, I'm just so glad that somebody thought to bring me back. That was mm. really nice. So you've played a lot of scenes with Brett, uh, Brent Spiner and Jonathan Frank. So what were they like on set to work with? So Jonathan uh, had worked with my dad. Remember when I was talking about the showcases in New York? He had done some theater with my dad at a theater called the Impossible Ragtime Theater. So he knew my dad. So that was really nice. And he said, you know, my trailer is your trailer. If you need anything, uh, don't hesitate. Really, really super friendly. And they were joking around a lot. I will say this. Whenever you're on a last episode of a TV, I think at the time it was 22 episodes. So it was the last episode of fifth year everybody is tired they're tired i've done this a bunch of times you come on a show and you're all excited and people are like oh my god this is the last <laughs> episode we need a vacation really badly and we need to be able to eat and not worry about getting weight and, and then the first episode of the next scene where everybody's like oh it's yeah, summer so totally different um so brent spiner was lovely but i will say this patrick stewart kept trying to fix me up with brent and I think the first day he said out loud, I think that Brent and Elizabeth should go on vacation together. And I think Brent was so embarrassed he didn't speak to me again for the rest of the episode. <laughs> That's my imagination of it, but it may or may not be true. But he's lovely. I've actually seen Brent. I've actually seen everybody, you know, in, in you know, conventions. And um, Brent and I have come uh, mutual friends that I see from time to time. And... I, I saw a bunch of them at uh, the opening night of Blunt Talk, which was a series that Patrick did with Seth MacFarlane. Very and cool. There were a bunch of us there at the opening for that. That's a funny story. Do you want me to tell you that story? Yes. Okay. So I, the reason we went to Blunt Talk is Adrian Scarborough, who's an, a British actor, was playing Patrick Stewart's um, butler or valet right-hand man in that show. And he's a good friend. And he said come to the premiere and then we'll go to the after party at the Chateau Marmont. And I was like, awesome. Can you get us all four tickets? So my kids were like, probably, I have no idea how long ago it was. I would say the kids were like maybe 16 and 14, my sons. And we go to see the show and all of the cast is there. So I'm sitting with Marina and LaVar and Michael and Seth MacFarlane gets up on stage and he says, I am the biggest Star Trek fan. I know every line, every character. My dream has been to work on something with Patrick Stewart. So we came up with the show and it's my honor. So at the after party, I'd had maybe a couple of glasses of refreshing adult beverages. <laughs> and I took my sons and I said, come with me and watch this. This very, very courageous of me went over to Seth MacFarlane, who I'd never met. And I said, so you're the biggest Star Trek fan, right? And he goes, yes. And I said, I'm Lieutenant Commander Shelby. And he looked at me and he said, that means you're Elizabeth fucking Dennehy. Said, <laughs> and then he goes, I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow of a great man, passing up one command after another. Decade, Battle Bridge. He starts reciting all of my lines. Oh, shit. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> My sons were like, Who are you? That's it's, awesome. There's no better feeling than looking really cool in your kids' eyes. Yeah. <laughs> That's 100 percent true. So uh, what did you say when he did that? Like, like were you like, did you know what to say next? I said, thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much. But that was really risky because he could have been like. I don't know what you're talking about. Get away from me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was so, <laughs> that was so, so funny. He was really, really a good sport about that. He was great. Yeah, the, see, my boys were were freaking <laughs> out. They were freaking out. See, that's why we do what we do. See, I do what I do to impress my wife. So I'll, I'll be, you know, so a certain, certain actor, someone will be like, she'll be like, oh, I, know, I love that guy. He's like, oh, I'll make sure the person says hello to you. That's how I, <laughs> that's how I can keep doing what I do. It, it, yeah. it, that's what matters. It's impressing the other people around us, isn't it? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, that was really great. It was really fun. So when you heard that you were going to come back for season three of Picard, how did that come about? What Did you think about it? Be like, eh, I don't know. Or did you just immediately be like, yes, I want this? 
So it's a funny story. Um, in November of 2021, so back in like going everywhere, masks, washing your hands, mm. vaccinations, boosters, I was asked to do a convention in London. I can't for the life of me remember which one. So don't ask me. Um, and I said, yes, because we love traveling. And my husband and I went, John Billingsley was there. We were on the flight together in the car. God, he's such a fun guy. We had so much fun. We became really good friends. And Alice Creek, is that how you say her name? Creek? Creek. I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to, I think so. I'm pretty sure. The Borg, the Borg Queen. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And uh, we really hit it off. I loved her. She'd worked with my dad. We had a great time. And I took a picture of uh, a selfie and put it on on Twitter. And I, I don't really know how to work Twitter. Twitter scares me a little bit. I'm really not fluent in Twitter. But I put it up. And for me, get 2,000 likes and retweets. I came home on Monday morning and that day my agent called and said, they just asked you about your availability for Picard. I was like, whoa, that was a powerful tweet. Who knew? I, I have no idea if it had anything to do with it, but it was a weird coincidence. 30 years, really strange. And so I was like, yes, hell yes, absolutely. Because I keep getting asked the same question over and over and over again at all the conventions. Why didn't they ever bring you back? They should have brought you back. Do you read the books? No, I don't read the books. Um, you know, the lower depths animation, that was fun. Uh, you know, so it feels like now I have something else I can talk about finally. And um filmed on uh, one day in February, 2022. So I've been sitting on the secret for um, more than a year. So oh, I'm really Jesus. glad to, to keep it a secret. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause they filmed season two and three at the same time, which I think was really smart during the pandemic. Who knew what was going to happen? Yeah. You know, so um, yeah. So thank God it's out and, you know, everybody can talk about it now and I don't have to keep the secret. I <laughs> So much time went by that I literally forgot about it. <laughs> and I think one of the cool things is not only did they bring your character back, but she got to sit in the captain's chair on the Enterprise. What was that like for you? It was really exciting. It was very nice. It was uh, the best part about it was that we they got rid of the onesies, the skin tight onesies, and we're in these beautiful tailored suits. I actually wish I had mine. It's so very flattering, very comfortable, and, you know, without giant wedgies. So um, very happy about the costume, and the set was unbelievable. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would have loved more interaction with the other actors, but again, this was like not mask on until you're actually speaking, um, you know, everybody really being distant from each other and protected, and so, um, yeah, I, I had a great time. It was in and out in an hour. It was really, really fast. So when you talk about playing Shelby, once again, you're talking about 30 years later for this character as well. What was your approach? Did you think about how you, did you approach the character a little bit differently given the amount of time that would have passed in her career at this point? Mm, yes, I think that it was easy to play Shelby 30 years later because the seeds were planted for her ambition, her drive, her determination, uh, that she had survived and risen as high up as she could be. If she had been some, you know, housewife in an apron, that would have been a journey that I would, I would have had to figure out. But the fact that, you know, it looks like she, her trajectory was predetermined for her from 30 years ago, that she was going to keep her nose to the grindstone and, uh, and, you know, get, get, continue to get A pluses. <laughs> so what do you think about her ultimate fate? In the, in the show did you were you're like oh or you're like you know okay cool with it i kind of love that people leave people guessing and i mean it is the season finale of the show the series finale of the show so um you know who knows what might happen mm. who knows if that was a pre-filmed thing by the borg maybe I don't, you know, with TV and, and in sci-fi and fantasy, anything is possible. 
Mm. I would hate, I, yeah, it would make me sad if she was dead, dead and gone forever. Yeah. You know, while I can still memorize a crap ton of lines, it would be nice to <laughs> get to that facility again. Mm. So, so what's next for you? I am currently acting in a humongous Western saga called Horizon, written, directed, and starring Kevin Costner. Um, it's four movies, and I did movie one in September in Moab, Utah. And I'm going to back to Utah in June to do movie two. I And I play an Irish woman. I play um, Mrs. Reardon, married to Michael Rooker. Oh, very cool. Yes, he's not blue in this. He's playing an Irish guy. <laughs> Sergeant Major Reardon. And it's set uh, after the Civil War. So... It was, um, had the most amazing time in Utah and I uh, had to wear a hoop skirt and a corset and look really old. Like, yeah, I, I, people say I'm unrecognizable, which is a compliment. So <laughs> had a great time. Sienna Miller is number two on the call sheet. Kevin is number one and she is a love and Moab, Utah is one of the most beautiful places. I can't believe this place exists on earth paradise so i can't wait to go back i do that in the beginning of june and then i'll go back at some point for movie four and then um in june also i direct um so speaking of ulysses james joyce's uh, i don't know if you're familiar with bloomsday but every june 16th which is the day that james joyce place the events of his book, Ulysses, Irish actors get together all over the world and read excerpts from Ulysses. And my husband played Bloom for years at the Hammer Museum in LA. And uh, I directed last year and I'm directing again this year. So tomorrow I have a rehearsal with the actors on Zoom. And I am chairing a fundraiser for the Independent Shakespeare Company. I'm crazed right now. I'm super, super busy. Um, yeah, so life is good and cheering for my my sons going to the Nifty Film Festival for Williams Film and then to Palm Springs Festival at the end of June for his film and, tr you know, trying to fit travel in wherever I can. My niece is getting married at the end of May. So, you know, it's all go, all go. And uh, Jack, my son, who's in that TV show about a chef set in Chicago, uh, that will be premiering in June. So all exciting, wonderful, magical stuff happening. Cannot complain. Very cool. Are you ready to talk about the Costner movies? Come back on the show and talk with me. It's been an honor to speak with you, Miss Denny. Yeah, let's make sure I don't get cut out. <laughs> I, I, oh God, that'd be awful. But that we'll would still be horrible. we'll still do the <laughs> we'll still do the interview anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> that would be awful. Yeah, well, I, if they bring, if they're bringing, bringing me back for a movie too, I, I hope that means that um, I, I survived. Or be weird continuity on, on their part. <laughs> yeah, so, he, and he, oh my gosh, he is a doll. He's an absolute love. So, and it's wonderful being directed by actors. Oh my gosh, they always know the right thing to say. <laughs>